Go away. Thank you. <laughs> the idea of de-extinction first went public just last spring at TED and TEDx. And in Washington, D.C., 25 scientists held forth, and a new idea uh, went completely public. Thanks to Chris Anderson, by the way, that happened. I'll report a little bit what's happened just in the months since then. One of the speakers was a woolly mammoth expert who had discovered that the closest living relative of the mammoth was the Asian elephant. Now, with genomic closeness that close, you can conjure. Um, you could use this amazing new genome editing tool called CRISPR, and, uh, which is sweeping the biotech labs. And one of the people using it is George Church at Harvard on a known mammoth gene for the production of uh, cold-tolerant hemoglobin. And uh, it's, a, it's a test. The test is far along. They've moved uh, the gene from the computer into living elephant cells. And a science uh, article will come out of this. This is the state of progress. George has uh, four postdocs working on this. And their ultimate goal is vast herds of new Canadians, <laughs> or returned Canadians, uh, back in the Arctic where they belong. We may need them back. Uh, a Russian scientist named Sergei Zimov has a theory that would put the mammoths to work. He says that the world's largest biome used to be what was called the mammoth steppe. Uh, it was arctic grasslands kept in order by uh, dense herds of megaherbivores, including mammoths. When humans killed them off, tundra and boreal forest took over. And right now, thawing tundra is releasing greenhouse gases. Grasslands, if they could be restored, fix carbon. So to prove his case, Sergei is created in northern Siberia, a place called Pleistocene Park, where he has dense herds of animals like musk oxen, and they are indeed grazing and trampling the tundra into grassland. And Sergei is waiting patiently for mammoths to come and join his herds to help stabilize climate change. Next animal. Passenger pigeon. Okay, in North Dakota, uh, science fair, Ben Novak, imagine how he could bring back the extinct dodo. Twelve years later, we employed him full time to bring back the extinct passenger pigeon. Here he is at the paleogenomics lab at UC Santa Cruz, um, preparing passenger pigeon DNA for sequencing. Uh, which will then be uh, compared to the DNA from this closest living relative, which is the band-tailed pigeon. And results from that will give us a sense of the population history of passenger pigeons going back many millennia. And it will show the way to possibly bring passengers, passenger pigeons back for future millennia. Beth Shapiro has three students working on this project. The science paper is in progress, will come out this year. And uh, an interesting fact about the passenger pigeons is they're dimorphic. The male is quite gorgeous, but it's not for our benefit. Um, it's for the female. But this then raises the question of who exactly is going to parent the first revived passenger pigeons? Well, at the Bronx Zoo in New York, there is a flock now of band-tailed pigeons who are being groomed to become, eventually, the first surrogate parents of a revived, formerly extinct offspring. Next animal. One of the founders of conservation biology said at TEDx Extinction that biotech could help solve one of the most serious problems uh, that faces endangered species. It's called the extinction vortex. And what happens is that very small populations, remnant populations, inbreeding and genetic drift makes the animals less fit, which leads to a smaller population, which makes more animals that are less fit, and so on down to nothing. Any form of somehow restoring genetic variation, variability, is called genetic rescue. The idea is to somehow turn 
this whole process backwards and get out of the extinction, the extinction vortex. So we got asked by a government agency to see if、uh, any of this could help black-footed ferrets. The story on ferrets is they lived solely on prairie dogs, and when farmers and ranchers declared war on prairie dogs, the ferrets were collateral damage, and they were declared extinct in the 1970s. But then, hello, ha! But then,、uh, in 1981, a tiny remnant population was discovered in Wyoming. But there's just seven founders, and with just seven founders, you know there's going to be inbreeding problems. So then you wonder if maybe in the museum specimens there could be restored, basically old gene variants that could be brought back into the current population, and in a sense, young ferrets could breed. With their genetically richer ancestors. Now, there's a lot of、uh, captive breeding going on in this government program. They've、uh, produced thousands of ferrets, and、uh, many have been released to the wild. Ryan and I got to go along on one of these release events,、uh, where we discovered that a ferret isn't necessarily thrilled <laughs> to go down into a hole probably occupied by a horrified prairie dog. And they're fast, and they're smart, and、uh, they bite. <laughs> so research is now going ahead to see if biotech can help these animals, make them more brave.、Um, <laughs> And so we're、uh, right now sequencing two、uh, animals from the living population. It doesn't hurt them.、Uh, two from the frozen zoo in San Diego, which may have some nice old DNA, which is richer. And、um, that is going ahead with. This is just a tiny portion of the people who've dedicated their lives to saving this exquisite creature. And part of the idea is this is such a model animal. That if this form of genetic rescue works for the black-footed ferret, then it may well be able to work for other endangered species. It could help revolutionize conservation.、It、certainly revolutionized us, because、uh, we discovered that our original mission was too limited, and、uh, in fact, it needs to broaden、uh, so that we're not just、uh, reversing extinction; we're helping prevent extinction.、And、if all goes well. Uh, these animals will be around long after we're gone. What about the ferret who had doubts? Well, I can say that he made his peace with living wild. <laughs> Thank you.